We're going to change over from PERS to over to PCB2 and change a little bit about the study type we had in the last one, uh, challenge and controls. Here is more of an observational study. Uh, it's doing surveillance, very collaborative throughout the industry, and really focusing on looking at the pigs that are doing well. So rather than focusing only on the pigs and the sample types that are being sent to the diagnostic lab, I'm saying these pigs are doing well, how can we replicate that? I'll give you the summary first. Mutations of PCV2 do occur. So it is a DNA virus. It does mutate. It doesn't mutate near as much as influenza or PERS. PCV2 commercial vaccines, including Circleflex, are continuing to cross-protect against the strains that are available today, whether that's a PCV2A, PCV2B, or PCV2D. We do believe, however, that we need to continue monitoring, we need to continue doing the surveillance and looking for what strains are out there. Very similar to how we do it with PERS today, we want to continue doing it with PCV2. And when we do have PCVAD and the finishers, we really believe that root cause analysis is very important to really make sure that we're looking at each part of the picture that can have an impact on the health of those pigs. So as I said, I, I believe um, that the evidence is out there that commercial PCV2 vaccines continue to protect against all the mutations that are out there. I believe in that. PCV2B became the dominant strain when uh, the vaccines were launched, so all the vaccines that are out there today are based on PCV2A. The dominant strain in 2006 when the vaccines were launched was PCV2B. And today we're seeing an increase in the last couple of years of PCV2D. I want to describe a little bit about that, is that PCV2D was described by Dr. Tanya Presnick's lab in 2012, and it happened to be because her differential um, open reading frame to PCR was not detecting a certain virus. Well, when she dug into it, doing some pretty good research, she found that there was an additional of one amino acid that indicated that her PCR would not pick it up on ORF2, even though it would on ORF1. So since 2012, We've continued to monitor University of Minnesota, Iowa State, and the Health Management Center names. Their PCRs now all pick it up. They always have, but you'll see in a little bit the number of strains that we're seeing at each of the labs. If we go back to the NOM study, uh, Dr. Cheryl Dvorak and Michael Murtaugh took a look at the samples, the serum samples in mid to late finishing pigs, and they found out that Roughly 82% of the pigs that had a PCR that was sequenceable, they found PCV2B. 35% of those were mixed infections with PCV2A, but roughly about 50% were PCV2A. But if we look at more recently, since 2012, we look at the actual diagnostic submissions sent to Iowa State in the top graph and to University of Minnesota in the bottom graph, we can see a couple trends. One at Iowa State in this top graph from 2013 to 2015, you can see that there's been a large increase in the last year of the number of sequences that have gone through that lab. Instead of 50, we're now at about 150. University of Minnesota, uh, they're not doing near as much. This is only 2015. But you can see the blend of sequences that are out here, A's, B's, D's, and E's. And if you only look at the VDL, you see a large proportion here, roughly about 50%, 48% are Ds, whereas the remainder are As and Bs. If you look at this mixture in 2015 for Iowa State University, pretty similar, 75% or so um, were PCV2Ds. Remember, these are cases that are going into the diagnostic lab because the practitioner believes that there probably was a problem seeing clinical signs or production issues. They asked for pcv 2 PCV2 PCRs, and they even wanted to further follow it up with sequencing. If we only focus in on the Iowa State numbers that you saw on the previous chart, the top chart, this is more graphical, easier for me to see, and very visual. You can see the large increase in 2015 of the total number of samples and the high, uh, high grouping there of PCV2Ds in the green. Now, if we only look at 2015 and compare University of Minnesota and Iowa State Diagnostic Labs, one, you can see there is a difference in the number of samples sequenced. 
And I do appreciate uh, Dr. Kent Schwartz at Iowa State and Cheryl Dvorak for providing this information, digging into it for me, and for the industry, really. Is that you can see PCV2B and PCV2D are the most prevalent out of these samples. Again, these are situations where the veterinarian thought there was a problem, likely PCVAD. They wanted to not only uh, have a PCV2 PCR, but further sequence it. So those are the cases, and that's what data we had available to us at the beginning of 2015, that going to the diagnostic labs, finding what's out there. But with, since 2012, the NOM study, there hadn't been, that we're aware of, any surveillance of just normal pigs out there. So what we wanted to do is uh, look for these controls. So we identified uh, farms. We were lucky enough to work with 14 different uh, organizations throughout the U.S. Um, that, had, that wanted to understand the PCV2 in their systems. They all use CircleFlex at weaning age in this situation. This data that we'll show you is on CircleFlex vaccinated pigs. Their nursery and finisher performance were meeting their expectations. So whatever those expectations were in those specific systems, they were meeting their expectations. They would have considered them in good health, good production performance. There is no clinical signs in these barns, in these flows of PCVAD before the study and even after uh, these samples were taken. These pigs that these samples were taken from showed no PCVAD all the way through market. So out of the 14 different uh, production systems we worked with, we sampled uh, 48 farms. I say we um, really want to thank the veterinary staff, uh, production teams for gathering that information. You can see we mainly took serum and oral fluids. I'll let you know, most of these farms, we did target uh, the sick pens. You say, why did you target the sick pens? You're trying to look for healthy pigs. We targeted pigs uh, that were showing no signs of PCVAD, they could have been pulled into the sick pen because of ruptures, lameness. We thought it could have been parasuous. We thought choosing those with compromised immune systems would have been the best chance for us to find the PCV2 that was present in that population. So you can see 23 and 24 farms where we found serum and oral fluids. One farm we got lung homogenate out of uh, necropsy pigs out of that sick pen. Again, no one showing PCVAD. These samples were sent to uh, Iowa State uh, for the lung homogenate and the serum and oral fluids all through the health management center names. At the herd level, we found 27 of the 48 farms had a PCV2 PCR that was positive. Not surprising to us. You may look out there going, gosh, they were vaccinated with CircleFlex. Why is there still PCV2 viremia out there? It's not surprising to us. The vaccines don't eliminate PCV2. It continues to be there. And that's why we still need to have vaccines available to us. This is regardless of vaccination protocol. Now, if we come from the herd level, we go to the individual sample level. You see here in column two and three, we have serum and oral fluids. I've left off the tissue homogenate because it was only one farm, five samples, uh, three that we sequenced. Of the serum, out of the 432, 12% of those roughly were PCR positive. Of the oral fluids, approximately 40% of those are positive. Again, not too surprising being that oral fluids are more of a population sampling rather than individual pig, so you have the opportunity to find out more positives. We break down these PCRs and we go down to sequencing. We targeted samples to sequence of 32 or less on the CT or CQ quantification cycles. It's the same thing, CQ and CT are the same thing. We targeted those because we were told by Iowa State University that this is the value of uh, the CTCQ that gives you the best chance of having a successful sequence. So being conscious of the money, we decided to target those. And if you see here, 100% of those with a CT or CQ value of less than uh, 30, 100% of those were sequenceable. In between 30 and 32, pretty good still, pretty good. Good spend of money. Those that we did try to squeak through because we really wanted them to, um, greater than 32, we were unsuccessful. So pretty good evidence. I think uh, what the information that Iowa State gave us, I think this is something to take home and use our money wisely out in the field. Uh, you may be very familiar with BioPortal if you're uh, working with PERS. Uh, this is one of our geospatial epidemiology tools that we're using with PERS, influenza, mycoplasma, and PCV2 as well. 
Uh, it's nice to, to see uh, the geography of these successful sequences. So you can see they're from North Carolina and also the Midwest. They were sampling in four other states uh, that those farms just happen to not have a sequenceable um, sample. If we break those sequences down now into the PCV A, B, and D, this is what we found on these 40 different samples. You can see that the majority of them were Bs and Ds, very few As. Once again, using bioportal information uh, from UC Davis, we put this in a linear dendrogram. You can see as a reference here, this is a 10% uh, heterology line. And you can see really all of the Bs here, they're within about 2% of one another. All of the Ds and Bs fall within approximately 5% of one another. And the As are slightly outside of that. But you can see on the ORF2 sequencing that we're using here, there's not much difference in this conserved region that, for the capsid protein. To me, this is, uh, this is really the accumulation of both the diagnostic data as well as these successful cases. Every colored dot you have here, whether it's blue or pink or green, those are part of our 40 sequences from our successfully vaccinated pigs. So these pigs were vaccinated with CircleFlex. They showed no clinical signs. Production parameters were spot on, according to the veterinarian and production team. But yet they were still exposed to each of these different viruses within these farms. All of the other um, cases that you have here that are not numbered, these are part of a 700 uh, sequence grouping that comes from the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Lab all the way from 2005. So this includes all of their sequences that they had there that went through some data integrity, uh, wiped out about 400 of them uh, for data integrity reasons. So you can see that the successfully vaccinated pigs in this study, observational study, are very similar all along these cases that have gone into the diagnostic lab uh, because of clinical signs. I do want to point out here that there is an outgrouping that we identified um, throughout the course of last year and through this uh, retrospective sequencing outlook. This is a uh, PCV2E. You probably saw it in a slide earlier and I have a question about it. But since 2000, well, since last year at Iowa State and now University of Minnesota, there's a couple papers that have been accepted and published um, on PCV2E. It is something, uh, it is another mutation that has five additional amino acids compared to, for example, a PCV2A. Uh, today we need to continue looking into this. Uh, the paper that's coming out has a very good pl uh, plausibility of the reasons where um, E than A came out. I want to share with you not only this inf the information I just presented, but all of the cross-protection papers that we have with CircleFlex today. From our heterologous licensing study down to our challenge studies, and then these most recent ones, either in uh, the U.S. or Korea, uh, we show heterologous protection against A's, B's, and even PCV2D's in these challenge studies. So why do we still get PCVAD out there? Well, we think we really need to go to root cause analysis. We're doing everything we can to make sure our vaccines are continuing to protect against the strains that are out there available today. We'll continue to do that. But we also think that uh, we should be able to not only diagnose properly, make sure we have antigen and clinical signs and lesions available, but if we do get a true case definition of PCVAD, is understanding, and I know you can't read this, but if you have an interest in it later on, let me know, really going down the root cause. Is it vaccine compliance? Is it the vaccine efficacy? Is it uh, vertical transmission of PCV2? Let's look at the root cause and not jump to conclusions. So in summary, PCV2 can be found successfully in vaccinated populations. Doesn't mean that there's disease there. The commercial PCV2 vaccines are cross-protecting, including CircleFlex. B and D uh, make up the vast majority. Understanding how to sequence samples less than 32 is important. Even though there's mutations, the vaccines are still protecting. We need to continue to monitor. And if we are getting PCVAD, make sure that we have a proper case definition and also that we go down the root cause analysis.